back around 2004, 2006-ish, um, right around the time that What the Bleep Do We Know and The Secret all came out, there was um, New Thought Teachings, which of course are not new at all, but New Thought Teachings began sweeping the country. And because of this, there was this evolution in the use of vocabulary words that we had used for eons before, but now suddenly they were being used differently. Words like energy, circulation, attraction, and vibration. So speaking directly about the secret, there was a whole lot of misunderstanding and misuse of the way these words were being used that caused this huge backlash against the film and what it was trying to accomplish. People were taking that film, believing that if they sat on their butts, they could be millionaires. And so the most important concept, the fundamental concept of The Secret, got lost in translation. And what is that concept, you ask? I will tell you that in order to play this game of attraction and vibration, you must BYOB. You must bring your own batteries. <laughs> And just for a moment, I tried to say we need to bring our own batteries, but that acronym got really dangerous, and I'll give you a moment. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. <laughs> so it's bring your own batteries, not bring our own batteries. So those drawn to specifically to the secret arrived what I call empty-handed. And because they arrived empty-handed, they ended up disappointed. And they ended up broke and angry. Some were homeless, disenchanted, and tossed out all new thought ideas as garbage. So when I say that they came empty-handed, what, what I'm meaning is that they did not bring a matching vibrational energy to the table when they watched that movie. They saw the movie and they went, oh, okay, bring it but they weren't bringing their self to it. And so to lay in bed and to affirm that you're a millionaire is lovely and it's fun. It's kind of like me sitting on the couch affirming I'm at the gym, getting healthy. <laughs> However, <laughs> teachers who are wise from Jesus of Nazareth all the way to Ernest Holmes and to teachers today will say the same thing using different jargon. You have to treat and move your feet. Prayer without works is dead. Bring your A-game. It's this idea that we have to show up. And um, I, one of the songs that we listened to before the service, and it's, it's one of the songs that Spirit delivered to me really nicely, is called Falling In. And there's a line in it that says, what I give to life is what I get back in return. We know this. We know this because we live this. So the thing is with anything new, like we were talking about last week, new can be scary or it can be an adventure or it can be totally lost in translation, this new information. Those living with a low vibration came to the secret and came to the teachings of the secret as if it was a Black Friday sale on life, just waiting for it to be delivered. And when they lost their money and they didn't get what they wanted, they called it a sham. And the backlash was that it was deplorable and it was a lie and it was cheating people. And even Fred Allen Wolf, who is a, a world-class physicist who was in both The Secret and What the Bleep, when confronted with the simplistic nature of this ask, believe, receive concept, even Fred Allen Wolf admitted that it didn't work that way for him. He acknowledged that a matching vibration was part of the experience. So this is where I've been all week. <laughs> In the movie Field of Dreams, this lesson is taught beautifully. Beautifully. At first, Ray hears this voice in the cornfield saying the words, if you build it, he will come. And he's freaked out because his corn is talking to him. <laughs> it's very disturbing. And then even after he acknowledged that he heard the voice, he had no idea what it meant. If I build what? Who will come? Why? Why is this happening? And so it became his work to raise his vibrational level to the, to the level of the voice, 
to the level of the call that he got. And he could have easily gone, silly, it's nothing. I'm losing my mind a little bit. I'm spending too much time in my corn. Whatever. You know, and he could have gone back to his life. But instead he said, okay, okay, this means something. This is important. And in making that choice to raise his level and to go on this adventure, he almost loses his farm. He's ridiculed by his neighbors and everyone in the community. He kidnaps a famous writer. He resurrects a long dead doctor who had dreams of being a baseball player. And not only this, he brings redemption and the game back to a group of betrayed baseball players, all while healing the relationship with his dead father. <laughs> Talk about saying yes to an adventure. I mean, holy mackerel. It's awesome. So the other big piece about this movie that strikes me vibrationally is that not everyone in the movie can see these players when they come out of the field and play. Um, Ray's brother-in-law and other families think that they're being mocked when he says, what do you mean you can't see them? You can't see them? And they think that he's making fun of them. And they try to pull him down to their level, their limited vibration, saying, you're going to lose the farm. You need to sign these, you need to sign these papers. You can't keep doing this. And, and there's this moment in the movie where he's got, I, no spoiler alert, the movie came out in 1989. So James Earl Jones on one side saying, you know, hold on to this. It's special. And his brother-in-law going, you're going to lose everything. Sign this paper. Literally back and forth, pulling him up, pulling him down. And, and at the end of the, near the end of the movie, something really real happens that makes it possible then for his brother-in-law to see the players. And then he's like, oh, don't sell the farm. <laughs> but it takes something to shake him up. It takes something to shake up his reality to raise his vibrational level. What's also pretty awesome about this movie and I just found out from Laverne that she's been there, is that they have created a place that's now real. You can go there. (laughs) In Darysville, Iowa, you can go to the Field of Dreams movie site where a family owns, runs the farm, runs the site. You can play on the field, you can walk into the corn, and you can just be there. And regardless of how you might feel about this movie. And I've got one more picture that I wanted to show you about, but just in case you go, and when I go, I'm going to be looking for these signs. But this is, look at that. It's beautiful. And so regardless of how you feel about the movie, because some people think it's cheesy and horrible, and that's fine. um, When I think about, there's a video, if you go to the website for the Field of Dreams movie site and the tourist site, there's a video that shows people coming to the field for all different reasons. And there's this family that has a child who is wheelchair bound with multiple disabilities and all this child wanted was to hit a baseball and run the bases. And they're not allowed to do that at their school or anywhere. So they went here and when you watch the video of this child and his mom holding the bat, hitting the ball, and she's running him around the bases, and he's smiling, and he's clapping. I dare you not to cry. It's so beautiful. It's so amazing. And it, the space was created for a movie, and yet the vibration of this place is so high because of that that the vibration itself took over. People needed to go there, just like they said in the movie, that people will come. They do, every day. Grown men reconnecting with their fathers, with their memories of playing catch, of standing on a field, will fall to their knees in the middle of this baseball diamond, weeping. People will just go and stand and feel it. And children wait because on a regular scheduled basis, players come out of the (laughs) cornfield. I had to ask for him, like, do they do that still? (laughs) And so people from just regular movie buffs to actual people who are looking for something will go here like Mecca to just be in this place because of the vibrational field. So one last thing about this movie, and then I promise I'll move on. But um, I I re-watched it Friday, and I couldn't help 
feeling this connection. I just also recently finished a book, um, Nikos Kazantzakis' book, St. Francis, which is an interesting, interesting um, telling of the story of Brother Francis. I just finished reading that book, and then I watched this movie, and I couldn't help but make the connection of Ray listening and responding to the voice in the corn and Brother Francesco listening and responding to the voice that told him, give up the war, give up who you are, give up the music, give up your life, be seen as mad, be seen as an outcast, do my work. And I have to say that never before did I think that in a ministerial Sunday talk would Brother Francesco and a movie about baseball ever be combined. (laughs) And yet here they are. I love Spirit Stone. I love that you let me do this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting me do this. So short of hopping on a plane to Iowa or to a CZ or to any holy place to feel that vibration, how can we BYOB? How can we bring our own batteries to life? Well, I have some thoughts on that. One idea is to live in the now, to be present in each moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've all heard that. So Dan Millman uh, speaks about this, and he wrote a book called No Ordinary Moments. And he talks about how simple and how true this is. There is never nothing going on. Um, In the movie Peaceful Warrior, it's very funny when he teaches, when Socrates teaches Dan about this, and he's like, what do you see happening? And he's like, nothing. There's never nothing. (laughs) There's never nothing going on. There's never a moment to waste. So last week we talked about get one word. We talked about finding our word for the year. And and I'd like to share mine with you if that's all right. Is that okay if I share my word with you? All right. So my word is awaken. And I've been practicing with this word in my daily life at UAA here working during the week. And the other day I was walking across campus and it was amazing to me how many times I had to say, Wake up, Rachel. Wake up, Rev. Where are you? What are you doing? What are you thinking right now? What do you feel about it? Look around. Breathe. 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 And so it was like a rubber band on the wrist. My word awaken constantly, boom, brings me right back to where I am in the now. And I've noticed that at times being in the now is really wonderful. And at times being in the now is really painful. And it's really remarkable. And it's always surprising because it's a new now each time. There's a woman named Diane Merrichild, and she wrote a book called Open Mind. And she said this. We can bring a sense of wholeheartedness wholeheartedness to every task we do, beginning with something as simple as brushing teeth. Really brush without thinking of what you're going to do next. Bring all your attention to this act. Do it with reverence. Now go through your whole day this way. Bring all your energy to each task, however large or small. Wholehearted attention to every task, whether drinking a cup of tea, writing a letter, traveling to or from work, waiting in line, or listening to music, requires being where you are and nowhere else. Let go of thoughts about what needs to be done next or fears or expectations about what you're doing. Just do as though your life depends upon it because it does. Cool, huh? So I invite us all to try that. And I'm going to add a little thing to it that as we check into the now and as we check into how we're feeling and what's going on, to add a little pinch of gratitude for whatever it is that's happening. So even if the now, even if this wake up present moment is ouchy, to be grateful that I'm here to experience it. All right. So the second thing is fine tuning our vibration so we receive the message clearly. So I call it a God smack. (laughs) Some people call it a tap. I guess God speaks to them a little gentler than (laughs) God speaks to me, but... Each of us has a way of expressing how we feel when we get a hit of some kind of feeling or a hunch, turn left instead of turn right, and then, oh, we ended up in a place we didn't expect and exactly where we needed to be. 
Um, it's an aha moment, a revelation about a situation that you were stuck in or a next step you take in life. Some people call it the cosmic two by four. Um, and they realize, wake up. So it's about asking more, reading more, listening deeper, and looking closer. So one more movie reference that I found interesting when I was thinking about this tuning in and the words look closer. The movie posters for the movie American Beauty, the tagline was, look closer. This is not on every movie poster, though. It was only on selected movie posters and on selected materials that went out. And there is, it's, I like the director. But um, what's really cool is that the director, Sam Mendes, used this, this expression, look closer, as a theme for the whole film. And literally and thematically, it shows up. So there's like Easter egg hidden look closers in the movie, one of them is in Kevin Spacey's cubicle at work. There's a bunch of like notes and post-its and things on his wall, and there's one that says, look closer. Um, and it's everywhere. However, thematically in the movie, the movie's all about looking closer. The movie starts with this overview of a neighborhood and then zooms in to Kevin Spacey's house. So it's this whole idea of each character we judge from appearance and then we begin to look closer at each one of them. And so it's this idea of tuning in our vib vibration of life by honing in a little bit and looking closer at things. Similarly, two very brief examples from the art world. Um, dealing with tuning in. The first is a story about Rainer Maria Rilke, who is a wonderful, wonderful writer, poet, who's um, famous for the Live the Answers Now quote that you've seen. But there's a story that Rilke spent an afternoon in a museum in Athens studying and meditating on the statue of Apollo. And he spent the whole day there just sitting with the statue of Apollo. And when he returned to his hotel room, he wrote one sentence in his journal. And the sentence was, you must change your life. Just the time with that sculpture moved him to that. So similarly, and I've talked about this before, was the moment that I was in the presence of Michelangelo's David, which Heather can attest to, of the many times in Italy, it was another time I cried. I cried a lot. But I, I was amazed, staring at this work, the atmosphere, being in the atmosphere of this work, and believe me, this sculpture has its own atmosphere. It has its own vibration. And realizing that Michelangelo saw David trapped in the rock. You're all familiar with this interpretation of how he sculpted David. He, he got this slab of imperfect stone. It was all scarred and kind of nicked. And he saw the David in it. And he revealed him chip by chip. And I was just brought to tears. And I kept thinking, what can I do in my life that is that brave? That is that brave to reveal that? To have the courage to start chiseling, knowing that David was in there and that letting that guide him. He just knew. He tuned into the opportunity, he grabbed it, and he did it. So sometimes we, and this could just be the royal we, um, will see the big picture and we'll know just what to do. Sometimes we need to look closer and look for those opportunities. Sometimes they land in our lap, which is great. And sometimes it's like a radio with static. We need to fine tune our vibration, just adjusting that knob a little bit until the sound is clear. And that's a learning process. It's not like, oh, I used to turn the knob, but now I don't have to anymore. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yesterday I didn't have to turn the knob, and today I'm turning the knob. And so it's, it's, an, it's a learning process that continues. And when we get it right, just like a radio, we know it because it's clear as a bell. And then we can move forward. And then the last piece that came to me about how do I raise my vibration is you only get what you give. Again, we all know this. We understand how this works. It's the nature of circulation. What we put out, we get back. I was surprised. 
I decided to do a little experiment with this, and I did a little investigating, and I was surprised to discover that Donald Trump supports some charities. (laughs) Okay, well, it's not really Donald. (laughs) It's actually his children. (laughs) There's a Donald Trump Foundation, and his children represent certain charities. And I thought, okay, you know, well, that makes it actually a little sweeter. That maybe, maybe his kids understand that they can't take it with them. So let's do this. Let's move it forward. They support children's charities, St. Jude's, um, police athletic leagues. They, it's out there. It's going. And I'm talking about something deeper than money. I'm saying that in every aspect of our lives, we get what we give. So a smile, supporting a friend, holding a door open, gentleness and understanding, having or at least showing patience when you don't think that you have any left, returning the grocery cart. That's on my karmic list of to-dos. But it's that. It's that moment where yesterday I was walking in. No, was it Friday? It was Friday. I was walking into University Center Mall, and I walked into the lobby, and the security guard was sitting there, and there was a piece of garbage on the floor, like right in front of his desk. And I can't leave garbage on the ground when I see it because it makes me insane that there's a garbage can two feet from it. So I picked up the garbage, and I put it in the garbage can, and I looked over at him, and he went... It was like this understanding of, okay, we got it. We got it. So whatever energy that we are carrying at any time, whatever energy we're holding or carrying at any given moment, we're also emitting at that given moment. And we're emitting it into the space around us. So whatever level you're vibrating at, you are calling forth that vibration back. This is where our personal responsibility gets really hinky. Because if things feel yucky, the first place to check is right here. Where am I yucky? Where am I feeling yucky, holding yucky, sending yucky? So, and then that, that vibration gets raised, that vibration gets shifted, and you'll feel the difference. And for those who are skeptical, even if you don't feel the difference, you'll feel better because you'll have shifted yourself. So even in an, in an environment where I'm like, oh, I really don't want to be here. Okay, I'm going to shift my, my vibration to be higher, to be present, to be in the now. I still have to be where I am. And even if it doesn't affect what's around me, I'll feel better about it. I'll stop being yucky about it. And the truth is it will feel better. It will happen. It can't help it. It's the nature of some scientific thing that I don't understand. So there's an accurate but really, really annoying, pithy phrase that goes along with this, the whole God helps those who help themselves. Okay. Um, I I was going to use that pithy little saying today, but then I thought, you know, so many times people have heard that and it's so condescending. Well, you know, God helps those who help themselves. But then what happened was when I put it in my iPhone to remind me to put it in the talk, the auto, (laughs) sorry, the autocorrect on my phone changed it to (laughs) God helps those who help the elves. (laughs) (laughs) And I like that much better. So now I'm just going to say, you know, God helps those who help the elves. So (laughs) help some elves. It it works much better for me. (laughs) So I'm going to close with this quote from Michael Beckwith, Reverend Dr. Michael Beckwith, who is such a powerful force of vibration on this earth. I'm so grateful for him. He's been, lately he's been posting videos on his Facebook page. He's taking the dog for a walk and he videotapes him walking the dog and sending a message of love sending a a good morning message of, of uplifting thoughts. And one of the things he wrote was, today, refuse to see yourself as a recipient of negative vibrations or as a victim of subtle or gross influence around you. Practice broadcasting the high vibrations of your inner radiance 
remembering all the while that the place upon which you stand is holy simply because you are standing there. We're going to pray. Feeling that vibration of just those words, just those thoughts, the ideas circulating, the the ideas that are running through each of our minds right now. Thoughts and ideas of how we can raise our vibration, how life can be sweeter and more loving and more open, more powerful. How we bring to life so much, so many gifts. And that life returns them back and with more and more. And the circulation just keeps going. We don't need a movie or a book or teachers or anything to know that this much is true. That when we raise that level within us, when we smile at someone, when we send love to the person who cut us off in traffic instead of cursing them when we send love to them and safety and wisdom to them things are better we feel better the energy around us feels better and so it's that power that we carry that power that we hold that is God that spirit That's the batteries that are in the Energizer Bunny that are in each one of us. Those batteries, that's God. Bringing our own batteries, that's God. And so if the word God is holding negative vibes, negative energy, negative feelings from the past, I invite you to see it differently right now. I invite you to open your mind to the word God as an it, an essence, a vibration, an energy a source that's within each of us, within me, within you, within those we disagree with, within everyone in this building, within everyone around the world. It's the same thing. It's the energy source that provides us with love and light and peace and power and possibility. Knowing that that's true, about each and every one of us in this room and beyond, knowing that that is true about the essence of spirit. I now hold in the light Sarah's friend who's moving into the experience of adoption, knowing that the divine, the divine opportunity is opening up right now. It's there holding in love and light. All those who requested prayer from me this week, I know that once the prayer is thought, once the prayer is spoken, it's answered. And it's not our duty to look for what the answer looks like. It's our purpose in life to know that the answer is happening right now. It's unfolding. It's revealing. Holding in prayer and love the family of beloved Adom who passed away this past week. Holding in prayer the love that surrounds them, the comfort that surrounds them, the sweet, cherished memories of that beloved young man. As we celebrate his life tomorrow, I will know that he's in the room with us, holding the hands of his mother and letting us all know that it's okay. That he was here to teach us and we were gifted. And so taking this energy of this prayer, taking this energy of this day, taking the stone that we are holding in our hand and imbuing it with everything that we are ready to not carry, everything that we are ready to let go of, and feeling from that stone the vibration of earth and creation that is everywhere and ours. I bless this day, and I bless this time, and I'm so, so grateful for this life. And so it is. Amen. Ashe.